Listening to the Prevailing Faith Broadcast, a podcast in Christ, with Pastor Charles E. Brown of the Prevailing Faith Bible Church in Monroe, Louisiana. Now, here's your host, Pastor Brown. Well, Blake, praise the Lord. Welcome to Prevailing Faith. Podcast. I'm your host once again, Pastor Charles E. Brown. I thank each and every one of our listeners, those of you that have been a part of what God has called us to do. And we're so thankful for the privilege and the opportunity to reach out to all you wonderful, God-loving, God-representative people. And we're certainly excited tonight that we have a chance to share with you again. So before I get really started, let's invite the Father in. O most glorious and magnificent Father, we count it a true privilege and an honor to be welcome into the courts of heaven, to have an audience with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Lord that you're forever present in our lives, that you've opened up your heart to us by giving us your supernatural, magnificent word, the spirit of truth. And Lord God, you sent and released to the believers your Holy Spirit, the great teacher, the great revealer of truth. And so, Lord, we invite you, we invite your word, we invite your spirit to lead us through your truth that we might share in a way that will bring great honor and truth to you, that it will encourage others to open their hearts and their lives that they might receive the divine purpose and direction that God has for each and every one of us. And Lord God, we thank you. That you once again will be the most heard, the most talked about, the most seen as we open up our hearts to be led by your spirit in the glorious, majestic, awesome name of Jesus Christ. We say amen. Well, we celebrate you because a lot of you, this is June, which is wedding month. It's where a lot of people get married. Praise the Lord. I was a June bride this Friday be 44 years ago. It's amazing what you can happen when you're only four years old. Y'all get that tomorrow. But I thank God that we're about to celebrate 48 years. But the purpose of what God called me to share with you this evening I got it from Mark chapter 9, verse 23. A lot of times I quoted from King James Version, but God took me back or reminded me, look at the way it is presented in the New Living Translation. Because in the New Living Translation, it reads as as this. It says, what do you mean, if I can? Jesus is like, what do you mean, if I can? Jesus says, Anything is possible if a person believes. And this is what God has been dealing with me when I'm looking into this. Is that we want to blame God or we want to blame the devil when God's saying it's everything that happens right, outstanding, supernatural in your life is according to what you believe. And everything that comes against you it's calling to what you don't believe or what you, you've you opened yourself to. And he's wanting us to remember that a lot of times the circumstances and the challenges of life, we want to blame God or we want to blame the devil. But we have to remember God gave us a part in there. And we have to take the time and see what is our part in there. What is God saying about what we're doing in our lives? Because he says, if I can, Jesus said, anything is possible if a person believes. And so we've been working primarily on marriages. And what God reminded me is what he said. He says, everything is based on what we believe and what we say. Because the truth is, we're going to say what we believe. That's what's going to come out of our mouth on a constant basis. So my question to you is, what do you 
do you believe? Because God can only follow what lines up with his word and what you believe. Because look, this is what God reminded me. Because we all go through this thing and, and it was released with Adam and Eve. When you look at Genesis 3 and verse 3, you remember that Eve was given the information. Now she may have gotten it through Adam, but she still was held responsible. And the devil started talking to her about why don't you eat the why don't you eat from the tree of, of forbidden fruit? They say you won't die, but you become as wise as God. We'll never be as wise as God. We only get a chance to enjoy his wisdom when we open up to him. But the key is this. She chose to eat the forbidden fruit. She had the instructions. And what God is trying to get us to remember, he's told us what to do. Now, if we refuse to do it, then that, the, uh, um, the responsibility falls off of him, falls on to us. And so what God is wanting us to remember, if you live and do what I'm telling you to do, because that's why a lot of people don't miss. You know, you may say the born again prayer, I decree and declare that Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. What well, Lord means that you no longer make the decision. What you think doesn't matter is what the word of God says is what matters. And the key to this is that God gave us the choice to let God be our personal Lord and Savior or not. And so that's what tickles me because they'll trap uh, men and women of God who uh, confess the word of God and live according to the will of God. And they'll say, what is your opinion? And the proper response is, I have none. My opinion doesn't matter. It's what the word of God says. God said what he wants and meant what he said. If you disagree with it, take it up with God. I decided to honor his word. And if the word exposes a part of me that's not submissive to his word, I go to God and ask him for his strength and his help that I might, might not do it. But you remember, Adam and Eve both ate the forbidden fruit. And then all of a sudden, they became ashamed of their bodies. And unfortunately, some people are not ashamed of their bodies anymore. They're showing everything. But when, when God spoke to Adam in Genesis 3, he called him. Look at verse, um, verse 10. Or verse 9. And the Lord called unto man, where are you? In other words, like God didn't know where he was, he was asking him. And Adam replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. You cannot hide from God. But God gives you the opportunity to make the decision. And Adam says, I was afraid because I was naked. And God asked this very powerful question in verse 11. Who told you you were naked? And the Lord knew it, but he still gave Adam a chance to get it right. And before you get down on Adam, if he hadn't have done this, we do it every day. And what we're working on is to not do it every day. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat from? And Adam replied, it was a woman. And that's the part of what we're working on this evening. Because we don't want to take responsibility for our part. We want to blame God for not answering your prayers. You want to blame the devil for blocking. But God says you have a responsibility in this. And that's why he says, first thing Adam said, it was a woman. He didn't take responsibility for what he did. He blamed Eve. He said it was a woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Let me tell you, Dr. Price would make this statement and it's kind of gross. But it come up, so I'm going to share it. He says, nobody, I mean, you know, people are in their, in not in their right minds. They, they can do anything. But any reasonably intelligent person who is an adult with, with proper mental and uh, uh, capacity, you don't have to talk to them out of eating out of the toilet. 
You may have to do it to a dog, but you don't have to talk them out of it because that's repulsive to most human beings in their right mind. But he's saying, Adam said it was a woman. When he told you, don't do it, Adam. Then verse 13, and Lord asked the woman, well, Eve, what have you done? Well, Eve turned around and said, the serpent deceived me. This is why I ate it. Yes, the devil is a deceit, deceiver. He, that's his main character. But you still held re responsible because most of our problems or our challenges in life with God and the, and the things of God is we're not making sure that we're following God's instructions. I know you want to blame uh, your wife and the wife want to blame the devil, but God say it's you. You made the decision. You knew right and wrong. Because you know one thing I, I play with the kids, you know, because that's one of the first things you teach a child. Before you cross the street, what do you do? You look right and left and then right again or left again to make sure or ensure that nobody's coming. Because on my wife's new vehicle, I have a, a it has a blind spot for me on her side. On the driver's side, I have no problem. But I got to make an extra effort that I look to see what's coming because if not, I don't want to have an accident. And I definitely don't want to have it in her new vehicle because she clearly told me it's hers. <laughs> I just happen to pay for it or I pay a part of it or it's in my name. But anyway, but listen, go back to this. Proverbs 18 and 21. We are held responsible. He's telling us, I've told you what to do. If you refuse to do it, it's not God's fault. But what we're going to do is we're going to take the high road. We're going to take what God says, and we're going to act accordingly. And it says in verse 21 of 18, Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue can bring death or life to those who Love to talk will reap the consequences. King James Version says, life and death is in the power, in the authority of the tongue. Everything you say, everything you speak out of your mouth, because your mouth is a very unique instrument. It's the only part of you that can touch the natural realm and the spirit realm simultaneously. And that's why we have to be careful what we're saying. So what God is reminding us, if we know what is right and don't do what is right, then it's not God's fault. And I can even kind of stretch and say it's not the devil's fault because he's a deceiver. He's telling you, God told you he's a deceiver. So why would you listen to him? And, and verse 21 says, death and life are in the power of tongue. Have you been taking the time to watch over what you're saying? Because you're going to be judged by what you're saying. And God can only help those that are saying according to the will of God. And that's what I want to do. I want to take the time. I want to make the initiative that I follow his instructions. I say what he says when it comes to... Uh, his word. So I can be in a position that I can receive what God promised me. I want what God promised. I want my life to be in a way, in a position that God can continually minister to me and show me his love and his grace moving mightily on my behalf. Because he says, Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Then another principle that we have to be aware of, this is all in line with what you're saying. And I'm going to get to the point I'm trying to get you to hear. Because Jesus says, you ask me if I can. He says all things are possible if you believe. If you don't believe what the word of God is saying, then you, that means that you won't take the time or the initiative to say his word. You don't regard what he said that life and death is in the power of the tongue. You will just say anything. And the problem with saying just anything 
It opens the door for everything that you don't want to happen to show up in your life. And I don't want to be in a position where everything can happen. I only want what the word promised me to happen in my life. That's a good place to say amen. Because he said in uh, James chapter 4, verse 2, you, um, New Living Translation, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take, it, take away from them. But this is the significance of what we're going to work from. He says, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And so what we're working on is on, on marriage. And the problem is we're dealing with marriages that are tore up from the flow up, people that got wrong thinking. And the key is he told us in uh, Matthew 18 that if any two would touch and agree about anything, that he will be in the midst of them. Well, I want God to be in the midst of what I'm dealing with. I want God to have his glorious, magnificent way. I want God to flow in me like a mighty, mighty river. Well, that can't happen unless I'm willing, able, and ready to do it God's way. What about you? What about you, my friend? What about you, my, my brother, my sister in the Lord? Are you willing to do it God's way? Because then when you do it God's way, it puts you in an environment where you can have exclusively supernatural what he says. And so before we go to blaming God, because things are not happening the way we thought, because I've been there, done that, where my flesh, this lady couldn't say flesh, she said flush, where my flesh is wanting to get angry with God and I have to take the time to ensure or make sure that I'm saying what God told me to say. That I'm not just running my mouth haphazardly without including, without utilizing what God has told me to do. And that's what I want to make sure, ensure I'm doing. God, I want to make sure that I am doing and saying what you call me to do. Because he's telling me, he says, if I can, the problem is not God, it's us. The problem is us not asking, not following up or doing it God's way. And that's not what I want to happen to me. What about you? I want to put myself in the environment where I'm asking God and doing it the way God told me to do it. Isn't that our truth? That's a good place to say amen. Wonderful place to say amen. Because he says in James chapter 4 verse 2. He says you have you don't get it because you're not asking God. Well, okay God, if all you telling me I got to ask and I got to believe. Well, I need to work on my marriage. And so for my, fair, my marriage, <clears throat> excuse me. To be what God's calling it to be, I got to do it the way God's telling me. Yes, because he told us in Isaiah 43, 26, these are primary principle scriptures that you should already have in your remembrance. He says in 40, Isaiah 43, verse 26, God's telling you, remind me what I said. Remind him what he promised. And so now what we're going to work on, because I'm going to show you what God is telling us to do in our marriage, to remind you, don't blame nobody else. You need to repent, to go back and make yourself say what God promised you and commit yourself to believing what God has said. Not how it looks, how you feel, but remind yourself because when you do it this way, I'm giving these principles kind of fast because if you've been listening to our podcast, we've been going through these very same principles the whole time. We've been going through them the whole time trying to get us to understand 
Mark 16, verse 17. Look what he says here. This miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. I need the supernatural, miraculous, glorious, magnificent power of the living God in my marriage. And for that to happen, I'm going to have to do it God's way. I'm going to have to remind myself what he told me to do, unlike Adam and Eve. Then I'm going to have to put me in an environment where I watch what I say out of my mouth, like he told me in Proverbs. Then I got to remember, he says, he can only give me what I ask for according to his glorious and magnificent word. So I'm going to ask according to his word. And then he's telling me in Mark 16, verse 17, the miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. What? He said, if I believe this word and we're working on my marriage, so if I do it God's way, the miraculous, he's talking about miracles. He's talking about supernatural signs will accompany those that believe believe. I need a miracle because I can't watch a TV program. You watch them and I don't want to be married or you want to be married and then um, and uh, what was it? Uh, y'all had to look this up because I'm dating myself but that was this old cowboy picture that came on for 20 or 30 years called Gunsmoke and uh, Matt Dillon was the sheriff and Miss Kitty was his love interest. But from what I remember, they never kissed, and he never married her. But Matt, whenever he wanted to have a lady's co uh, company, he'd go talk to Miss Kitty, but he never married her. He never took it to the next level. Well, the point I'm trying to make, it was unrealistic. But God's wanting you to be able to do in the supernatural where you can make the supernatural change the realistic. He wants you to be in a place where you can do it. And he's telling you, he says, the miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. Lord, I believe for my marriage. My wife did. And then I caught on with it. And then because I believe in the miraculous power of God, I can cast out demons in the name of Jesus. And I can speak in new tongues. Because let's go, let's go to Acts 3. You, you all remember where they said, uh, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give it unto you. But this man is about to receive a miracle. He's an invalid. He's a, a paraplegic. I think it was both legs. But he's about to see, receive a miracle. But this is key when you look at Acts 3 and verse 5. And this is what the men of God given. I'm trying to tell you how to put your marriage back together. Because these same principles I'm talking about can miraculously supernatural change your marriage. If he can make a crippled man walk, he can certainly heal your marriage. If he says signs and wonders will follow them that believe, he can heal your marriage. Acts chapter 3 verse 5, he says, so he gave them his attention. This is a man that needed a word from God. And the key is expecting. And this is what's so significant. You got to do what the word says, which is what Adam and Eve did not do. You got to remind God what he promised, which is what he tells us in Isaiah. Then you got to remember that life and death is in the power of your tongue in Proverbs. And then he's telling you here, you got to expect. So you got to expect when you do it God's way, for the miracle power of God to show up. Because this man could have been like so many others. He could have rejected it when they asked him uh, for his attention. But if you pay attention to what the word of God and turn on your expectors. Because remember me remind you what a miracle means. It's an extraordinary event by divine intervention in human affairs. I need God in my marriage. If you want hell on earth, be in a bad marriage. You want confusion, you want to be in a confused, uh, troubled situation, be in a bad marriage. You 
have to want God and God wants to come in and make your marriage, just like he did for my marriage and many others, make them a miracle marriage. But you have to swallow your pride. You got to give up what you think and follow what the word says. Not going by, oh, what he did. No, he said, forgive him and let him go. Now, I understand. I always like when I get to this, I have to, I have to make, give a disclaimer. If you got a man or a woman that you can't trust because they, they have alcohol, drug abuse, uh, pornography, they have all these kind of issues, then that's a, that's a different case. But there are people, because they got this thing, they come up with uh, irreconcilable differences. And I love it what, um, what Rick Warren one of, one of the, has one of the largest ministries in the nation. He said, the biggest problems in a lot of marriages is they won't grow up. If the two of you would grow up, there's no outside people in your marriage. There's no, um, there's no alcohol or drug abuse. There's no adultery or fornication, no pornography. Then you can go to God and make it work. Now, let me tell you this now. Because we're talking about miracle power of God. You can have a marriage that has alcoholism, drug abuse, fornication, uh, adultery, and God can still transform it, but you're going to have to go to God to get it done. But that's what I'm trying to get you to hear. God is not moved by what's wrong in your marriage. He's moved by what you can bring him in to make it right. And that's what we're here to talk about. We want God to get in our marriage because God can bring in his miracle power. Yes, glory to God. Divine intervention in the human rights. Extremely outstanding, unusually accomplishment can happen in your marriage. And so remember what the paraclegic said. They said about him, he said, so he gave them his attention. And when he gave him his attention, he started anticipating. Oh my God, I'm getting excited. He started anticipating God showing up in his man. I know he wasn't married, but I'm trying to get you to hear where I'm coming from. If he could do it for a physical man who could not rock, walk, he can do it for a broke down, no leg marriage. He can change it if you get your expectors on, if you anticipate, you start getting excited. God, you coming into my marriage. I'm excited. I'm joyous. I'm rejoicing in you because I let God in. You had to turn your head off, baby, because God and unbelief going to show up like a brick bolt upside your head trying to make you think, <laughs> I watch this TV show. I mean, oh my God, there's so many... Every two seconds, they have any, they must have a budget out this world. They're having catastrophes and they're going out there to save people. You know, I watch it and trying to support them, but I mean, you know, it's unrealistic because I've known people who are in that profession and, well, I live in a country, a small area, but they don't have something going on every two seconds and they saving lives, all like that. But the point I'm trying to get you to hear is, don't make the mistake, Adam and Eve. Don't blame nobody else. You do it. You take what God's word and you do it. Because that happens a lot in relationships. Well, if he's not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. And she said, well, he's not going to come on. I'm, I'm not going to do it for him. No, you do what is right before God. And he says, remember, life and death is in the power of the tongue. Because we hit that a few messages ago about being encouraging to each other. If you told you that in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 11, I believe it is, if he wants you to do a perfect stranger, why wouldn't he want you to do it at home? And let me tell you, the devil's going to show you everything wrong with Sibidi Sam and olive oil, but you got to remember God put y'all together and God wants to be fulfilled in your relationship. And he's saying because the paraplegic got healed is because he anticipated. He looked forward to what God was going to do in his life. 
He he was obligated. Oh, yes. I like this word. Because if you're doing it God's way, God is obligated. He is legally, spiritually, and morally bound to do what he promised because you chose to believe. I wish I had more help than that. Because in the next word in there, he says, expecting to receive. That means when I hear the word of God and I've honored God by walking in obedience to God, then I have an expectancy because God cannot go back on his word. And then when I receive it, that means that I take possession of it. You know, because Dr. Price used this and other ministers use it. It's a powerful thing. In these United States, you can go get a vehicle, new, old, or in between. But the proof of ownership is the title deed. It's not the vehicle, but it's the proof of ownership, which is a legal document that is recognized in the state and local government. This is a legal document. And if you have it and it has no liens on it, see, in uh, some states we even give it to you, but in Louisiana, when you go to buy a vehicle or a house, legally the house is yours. Legally the vehicle is yours. But when you have a lien on it, that means that you borrowed money against it And until the lien is satisfied to the lien holder's uh, 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 specifics on the title, um, it's still yours. But if you sell it or if you uh, um, (laughs) you wanted to take the insurance off, well, the one who got the lien on you is going to put force place insurance on you until you pay it off or... uh, (coughs) You trade it in. But the point God is, I believe God is trying to get us to hear. I'm going through some areas. He says, Adam and Eve's problem was they didn't obey God. He gave them instructions. They didn't follow it. Proverbs 18 and 21. You're going to be, you're going to have to use your mouth to say what the word says. Isaiah 43 says, and your argument or your disposition or your place with God is to bring before God and remind him what he promised you. Because that's what God's going to do. James 4 and 2. He says he's going to do what he said. Not what you think. Not how you feel. He's going to do precisely exactly what he said. And that's all you can ask of God. Because that's what he's telling you. I'm going to do what I promised you. But you got to take the time, the initiative, the commitment to learn his word, speak his word, stand on his word, believe his word. And then the pressure comes off you because God tell you, don't worry. In Matthew, he said, don't worry. Why should not worry? Because you're trusting God and God is obligated to produce. I'm excited. What about you? Because as we go back to, we're going back to Mark chapter 9. We're going to go up to verse 9. Because now I know before we read this, some of you know ahead of time where we're going. But I'm not saying your marriage is demon possessed. But it can surely act like it. Just kidding. But you letting the devil and his bunch or your thought lack of revelation knowledge has taken over your marriage and God's telling you, don't worry about what he did. Don't worry about what she did. Come to me and speak what I say because then God's saying, I can come into your marriage supernaturally. And that's what you want, isn't it? Because look at verse 9 of Mark chapter 9, verse 9. And went back to the mountain and told him not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So he kept on, he kept it to himself, but after he asked each other, he meant by raised from the dead, and he asked and said, Why do you teachers 
of religion's law insist on Elijah must return before the Messiah comes. And Jesus replied, Elijah indeed coming first to get everything ready. Yet do the scriptures say that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with other contempt. And the part I want to drop down to, verse 17. Your marriage is in a rocky place. The devil has had has superior authority and God's telling you how to run him out. And look at verse 17. So one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son. Oh, I brought my marriage is what we're working on. You can't interchange that so that you could heal it. Lord, my marriage needs healing. And look what he says. And my marriage is possessed with an evil spirit that won't let him talk. If you do not take the God-given initiative, the devil will destroy your marriage. Because I remember this. I say it all the time. He will fight you tooth and nails to keep you from getting married. And then once you get married, then he wants to talk you out of it. Because that's just the way he is. And the very people that got up there, oh, I'm so glad you got to engage. Then as soon as you go sign the papers, I didn't think it would work. Because that's the way the nature of the flesh is. But God's saying, come to him. He promised to do miracles and he can do miracles in your marriage. If he can heal, if he can run the devil out of a devil uh, controlled boy, he can get it out of your devil controlled marriage if you turn to him. We're looking at the principles. Don't get caught up in the, in the, um, Everything but get caught up in the principle is if you can believe, he can do it. That's what we're working on. If you can believe, Jesus can heal your marriage. The word of God, the spirit of God. And look what he says. And whenever this spirit seizes him, oh my God, come on now. Okay. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day. I, I tried to find it. Some years ago with all this social media, they showed this grandparents, they were cursing each other out, saying all kind of foul, disrespectful things to each other. And the grandson recorded it and put it on Facebook. And I know it went viral. And some of you, some of my listeners know what I'm talking about. But when you have let the enemy run, it comes in. You might be together, but you are horrible together. You're cursing each other out, talking about each other's in-laws. You're, you're coming again, saying all kind of derogatory, foul things. And it's not of God. He says, whenever the ungodly spirit seizes him, it throws him violently into the ground. It, the devil will do that to your marriage. It will throw your marriage into the dirt. And then it'll start to foam at the mouth, start grinding his teeth and become rigid because that's one of the biggest challenges you have in a marriage. If both of you become rigid, who's going to listen to God? So I asked your disciples to cast out this evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Well, I understand they were coming to Jesus, but if you're born again, Jesus is living in you. You don't have to go find the physical Jesus, the spiritual Jesus is in the heart of every born again believer and you can speak with the authority that's in you. But let's read on if you don't have the revelation. Jesus said to them, you faithless people, uh uh-oh. If you're born again, you have the faith to believe you're born again, right? Well, you have the authority to use the word of God as your own because Romans 8 and 14 and 16 through 16 says you are now been adopted into the kingdom of God that you might be led by the spirit of the living God, excuse me. And he says, you faithless people. That's what you found with um, Adam and Eve. They had no faith in what God says. Because when God said, don't eat of the forbidden tree, they ate. Then they didn't watch what they said. They tried to con God. Come on now. You ever dealt with a two or three year old? (laughs) 
I saw this on Facebook uh, in the last month or so. This grandmother is asking a toddler, did you uh, urinate in your pants? And the toddler just started speaking gibberish. <laughs> it was hilarious. And she kept asking, did you wet in your pants? Oh, and she kept speaking gibberish. And finally, when the grandmother threatened her, she says, yes. <laughs> it's hilarious. But verse 19, Mark 9 and 19, Jesus said to them, you faithless people. See, this is what happens when you have no faith in the word and in the leadership of the Holy Ghost. The devil will have rest, rule, and abide. We're not rest, we'll have demonic rule in your household. How long must, must I be with you? How, must, how long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And this is what he's saying to you. Bring your marriage to Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Bring it to the word. Let the word be first and foremost in your marriage. Let the leadership of the Holy Ghost lead your marriage. So you can be who God, or it can be what God has called to you. And he said, brought the boy, so they brought the boy to him. But what happens, glory to God, when you bring your marriage to the altar of God, when you bring it before God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that devil going to start squealing because he won't give it up. And he threw the child violently into convulsions. Is that what happened to your marriage? Oh, that's what happened to mine when my wife was... <laughs> When my wife was trying to get me to come back to the Lord, I'm like, well, you serve God. I'm good. Leave me alone. Now, I had given up all kind of stuff, to, but I didn't want to serve God. Not the way he wanted because I didn't think I could because I was in my thinking. And sometimes your marriage going to fall into convulsions. <laughs> it's going to fall on the ground, foaming at the mouth, but cast that devil out. You got the authority in the name of Jesus when you gave your life to the Lord. And Jesus says, how long has this been happening? Now in that marriage, I mentioned other between those grandparents. They've been married for a long time. They had to be married at least 20, 30 years. And they're still arguing like cats and dogs. That is not what God called you to do in your marriage. He called you to get with the word, get with your belief system, believe the word, and cast that devil out of your marriage. And he says, how long has this been happening? And he replies, since he was a little boy, how long y'all been arguing like cats and dogs since y'all first got married? Woo, Lord. You know, we laugh about it now because even though we weren't born again when we got married, or I had I, I just wouldn't serve God. We had sense enough not to include outsiders in our marriage. We wouldn't tell our parents or our in uh, our, our, our family that we were arguing because they knew it wasn't gonna help. Now we got to the point we would have uh it got dangerous, yeah, we would have included them, but we wouldn't tell them because they're gonna pick a side. But my wife paid me a compliment, said, when I came into the family, we were the first one to get married of her four siblings, of she and her, her three, it was four kids total. And I came in with the desire to accept them because I wanted brothers and sisters. Verse 22, the ungodly spirit often throws them in the fire and into the water. Is that what your marriage has been? Hot and cold, hot and cold. On fire and in his own, <laughs> you got to drown it with water. But remember, the devil is trying to kill your marriage. Hello? And God's want to resurrect your marriage. Remember, the power of God has the ability to raise the dead. Oh my God, thank you. That means when you're serving God, I think that's a bell ringer right there. When you're serving God, it may look like it's over, but God said he is Alpha Omega, and he can turn that old washed up, tore down, throw out marriage and make it work for all y'all's good. Because you need to do it for your own sake, you need to do it for your family, you need to do it for your children. And who knows, 
the fact that you let God in, you may end up counseling people on how to let him in. Because that's what it is. In, in, in verse 22, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into the water trying to kill him. The devil is trying to kill your marriage. Don't let him. Use the authority that God has given you. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. Now that's the part that made Jesus mad. What you mean if I can? What are you asking me if I can? Numbers said, um, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that should repent. Hebrews 13 said, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if he can save my marriage, he can save yours. If he can raise the dead, he can raise you from the dead. Glory to God. But you've got to be willing to believe. Oh, no, this not going to happen without, without being challenged. Because the devil's trying to get, trying to destroy from you. And Jesus asked him and said, what do you mean if I can? I'm Jesus. J-E-S-U-S. And anything is possible with me if the person will believe. And that means I don't look at the end of the problem. I look at the beginning. I look at the creator of the universe. I look at the one who can answer. I look at the one that can raise the dead. And that's the word of God. The living, the supernatural God of all. The miracle, miraculous power of God. It can raise the dead. He says, what do you mean if I can? Quit letting the devil rob you. Well, you don't know what we've been through. You don't know what we've been through. But I do know this. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, can raise the dead. You, God can raise your marriage up to be what he called it to be. He didn't call y'all to battle and fight like cats and dogs. He didn't, he didn't call you to be married to make you miserable. No, he called you to be married so you could have a unified spiritual growth. Because he told you, he says, if any two or three were gathered in his name. That's why it's so important for a husband and wife to learn how to agree. Because your prayers are tied to your ability to agree on the word. Good place to say amen. Drop down to verse 28. Because the boy got delivered. And so can your marriage. Your marriage can be totally, completely delivered. You can run the devil so far out of your marriage. He'll, <laughs> I like what um, uh, Brother John Osteen used to say. He said, you can beat the devil up so bad that when they walk by your house, they say, oh, let's not go there. We tried and he beat us up too bad. Let's go to the next house. I'm talking about Joel's father. Verse 28. Jesus was alone in the house with the disciples and they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Why can't you cast the devil out of your marriage? Because you're not paying attention to the word. You know better than Adam and Eve. That's why you can't persecute Adam and Eve. You do the same thing. Instead of saying, Lord, I repent, what does the word promise me? Adam blamed the wife. What did the wife do? The wife blamed the devil. And the devil was laughing at him, even though he is spiritually condemned. And then he told him, um, Proverbs 18 and 21, be careful what you say. First Thessalonians 5 and 11, he says, you have to encourage each other, not tear each other down. Isaiah 43, he says, remind God what he promised you so he can work with you. He wants to help you. James 4 and 2. The reason you don't have this miraculous power because you don't ask according to the will and the word of God. And in Mark 16, 17, he says, signs and wonders, glory to God, are available to those of us that will believe this word. That will let the word of God change our marriage. Signs and wonders will be there. And then he says here in verse 29, this kind can come out only by prayer and fasting. You got to learn how to put God first so you can have 
the supernatural, miraculous, authoritative power of God operating and manifesting in your marriage. And God is willing, able, and ready to do it for anybody that will. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to lead you in two prayers. This first one is the one you you receive the salvation that's been bought and paid for. Because Jesus told you in, in James 3 and 7, you must be born again. None of this is going to make spiritual sense to you unless you're born again. And then you're going to have to let God transform your thinking because that's what he said in Romans 12 and 1, uh, 2. says, I'll renew your mind. How? By renewing your mind by meditating and thinking on the word of God. So he says that, and to be born again, based on Romans chapter 10, verse 9, this is a prayer. I'm going to ask every one of you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe God sent you to this earth specifically for me. I was predestined and called before I even came to this earth. And Jesus, you suffered on the cross for me. You were beating me on human recognition for me. You even died on the cross for me. But on the third day, God raised you from the grave. And you're now seated at the right hand of the Father. And now I have the honor and the privilege to invite you into my heart. That now I decree and declare According to the word of God, I'm born again in Jesus' name. Yay! Glory to God. We thank you, those of you that just said that for the first time, or those of you just rededicated your life to the Lord. Remember, if you just did that for the first time, or just rededicated your life, you can inbox me on Facebook. You can email me at pastor at prevailingministries.com, or you can call our prayer line and leave your information. And we have a little gift we'd like to send you. 318-235-6... I'm sorry. 318-215-6399. Well, we certainly appreciate that. Now, have we gotten everybody born again? They wanted to be... Let's, let's pray for marriages. Father, we dedicate this time of the year, especially for those that are making the decision to get married for the first time that your grace and mercy will be upon their relationship and their marriage. And Lord, we pray for the existing marriages, that they will learn how to cry out to you and let you be first and foremost, that they'll learn how to forgive each other, learn how to encourage each other, learn how to pray in agreement for each other, learn how to walk in love and righteousness together. Lord, we're just praying for marriages, that you will continually minister them and move them in the righteous truth. In the matchless name of Jesus. Well, once again, we celebrate each and every one of you that are especially vacationing this time of the year. And listen, I understand for some money may be real tight and extreme. Go to a park. Go for a walk in the country or somewhere. But whatever you do, learn how to take a break with your spouse so y'all can clear your heads and find a way to communicate with each other. And let me tell you, God loves you and so do we. And remember what the word of God says, walk by faith, not by sight. And listen, we'll be back live tomorrow at High Noon Prayer. And then again, Wednesday night live at 7 p.m. Everything is Central Standard Time. And then you can go through our history and uh, doors open each Sunday morning at 10 a.m. If you're in the area, we'll be honored to have you. If not, you can watch the program. We have a new program that starts at 10.30 each Sunday morning. And of course, each Monday night at 6 p.m., Prevailing Faith Podcast. God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord, and we'll be seeing you soon. Amen, amen, amen. Pastor Brown and Prevailing Faith Ministries want to thank you for tuning in and welcome you to email your questions, comments, and prayer requests to pastor at prevailingministries.com. Once again, this has been another episode of the Prevailing Faith Broadcast with your host, Pastor Charles E. Brown, who reminds you to walk by faith, not by sight. And God bless you.